Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain and educate and inspire. And on this channel, we usually do primitive build and or hunt videos. I know you've heard that a whole bunch of times. Well, there's no hunt in this video right off the bat, but it is going to be a primitive build. And we're going to show you how to make an arrowhead. And this video is for beginners. Uh, if you're looking for a easy answer on how to turn a piece of flint into an arrowhead this is not your video okay so if you're gonna get mad that you have to sit through an hour or an hour and a half of me giving you free advice on how to build an arrowhead just go ahead and hit dislike and put that big old mean sad mad emoji on there and tell me that that my channel sucks go ahead and do that now uh, this is for people that want to learn how to make an arrowhead and typically everything that I have done prior to this has been very advanced skills with Aboriginal style flint napping and I've had a ton of people reach out to me and just say would you please do a video for the beginners and I am happy to oblige in doing that. So here in just a few minutes we're going to run through some of the tools that I'm using, the rock that I'm using, and we're just going to move right into it. Before I go ahead and start smacking on this piece of rock I do want to mention that remember all of this is free information that I'm giving to people because I want you to explore your primitive passions further. I want to inspire people to say, I'm going to pick up this napping set that I've never used before and this rock and I'm going to start smacking on it and try to make my own arrowheads. That is my goal. I'm very passionate about it and that's why I'm doing this. But all of this stuff is self-sponsored uh, by my own business which is huntprimitive.com so you can check a link down in the description for that but hopefully you already know who I am you can buy this rock that I'm using uh, on my website you can also buy the tools that I'm using but quite honestly I don't care if you buy the tools from me or from somebody else because I don't make, I'm a custom archery shop. I make, you know, really I make my money to support my family with selling bows, arrows, atlatls, uh, stone hunting points, that kind of thing. I don't really make, you know, the money on selling supplies. I basically sell supplies to kind of help you guys. So if you want to purchase from me, that's great. Thank you for your support. If you want to buy it from somebody else, that's perfectly fine, but I will put links to the rock and the tools down in the description. If you find something somewhere else you want to buy, please buy it. The important thing is that you are breaking rock and trying to learn how to do this stuff because this is a dying art and I hope to inspire people. So anyway, sorry for rambling on. Let's move on to the tools and the rock and let's get this point made. All right, so here's the basics of the tools. And it's really important that I walk you through what this is kind of about. Now, I have to keep dropping everything because I'm not used to holding all the tools and everything at once. But anyway, so this is Edward's chart. And uh, it's probably the best in the country. I do a lot of work with this stuff. So I'm going to put it down for a second until I can explain some of the tools to you. So everything that you need to make an arrowhead is essentially right here. So now there's more that you can add to this, but this is all that you really need, quite honestly. So get you a leather pad, which comes with the kit. I like to have a little extra piece, which I don't usually include the extra piece, but you can actually cut a little piece off and make it. And the only reason I use the extra piece is because it's easier for me to just dump the little flakes as I go like this, as opposed to moving the whole pad. And so mostly that's what would we call that ergonomics as opposed to it's easier to move the little one than move the whole pad um, but anyway that being said you're going to be looking at kind of a, a big copper bopper and these are copper pipe fittings filled with lead and a wood handle attached to them and so we've got kind of a, a medium large one I do sell even larger than this and sometimes they're handy but it's not perfectly necessary and that's why I don't uh, I actually do very little with these well I wouldn't say very little but in the piece that we're working I use more this size and but I include both sizes because especially if you got a piece that's a little bit bigger this one comes in really handy and there and kind of the reason for that is if you always just use one 
you're going to put a lot of wear on it. It's really handy to have two, and if you're going to have two, you might as well have two different sizes. And then we have a pressure flaker, and these, it's a twisted copper rod, and it runs inside. Now, of course, uh, I'm hoping that if you're watching this, you realize I do a lot of work with antler and aboriginal style tools, but that stuff is really kind of difficult for people uh, to learn on. That's how I learned, and it took me years and years and years to do it. And for many years, probably a decade, I never even touched a copper tool. Uh, I was just on this mission of if I'm going to learn to flit nap, I'm going to learn to do it with Aboriginal style tools and, you know, deer antler, bone, hammer stones, that kind of thing. And when I got to copper, I finally had to put down my pride and say, I want to learn, I want to start using copper because A, time is money. And in reality is when I have hundreds, literally hundreds of stone point orders a year and stone knives, I have to be a little bit faster and more efficient in the process, but I still don't want to use, say, cut and ground slabs. I still like to use raw abstract pieces of rock like like this. Now, there's a lot of people that use cut and grind slabs, and there's nothing wrong with that if you're into the art of flint napping, but if you want to just be able to go into the wild, find rock, or, you know, buy rock like this and use it, um... You know, you're going to have a lot of abstract pieces. So anyway, that's why we're using copper today, because copper is easier to work than the antler tools. And if you want antler tutorials, we have stuff on that, and I will inevitably be doing more in the future. But anyway, so we got the two billets and uh, that come in my standard kit with a leather pad and also an abrader. And the abrader, we'll explain more on this later, and it's essentially when you have a, a fine edge, you use the abrader before you hit because it's knocking off all these little pieces. Now, when nobody explained this to me when I first got started. They just said, oh, here's an abrader, and you use it like this. And I'm like, that's unnecessary. And I'm working, and it only made sense to me after I used it for a long amount of time that uh, if I made a hit on the piece of rock without abrading it, that a lot of times my hit didn't go anywhere, that I just crushed the edge. Where the abrader, if you use it, will stiffen the edge and you can drive a longer flake. That is what this is for, is you're getting rid of all the little sharp, trashy edges. And it doesn't sound like it's important, but after you have done this for a certain amount of time, you realize how important an abrader is. And uh, historically, essentially we'd just use a little piece of hand stone or metamorphic stone and I've got several sitting over there. You've probably seen me use stones before as abraders. I sometimes use my hammer stone actually as an abrader. But when you get a kit, I send you a coarse aggregate like this. It makes a beautiful uh, um, abrader. So anyway, then the pressure flaker, again, twisted copper rod set into a hardwood handle. The reason I don't use, like on these, these are big, essentially big giant dowel rods that I'll put down in because they're not any, on any stress, stress uh, points. It's, it wraps around the whole thing, but when I do the flakers, I actually do them on a natural stick. That's why they look like this. They're not a dowel rod because you have stuff like grain run out. And what happens if you've lined the grain perfectly and you go to remove a flake, you can actually split the piece of wood if it's a dowel rod. But if you're using a natural stick, it's got grain that runs in a circular pattern because it's essentially a little tree or a stick. So it's got growth rings just like a tree. So it doesn't have grain that runs out long ways like this or like this. So that's why when you get a pressure flaker, I use sticks instead. Hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. Now, if you get a little bit, you can use this for just about everything. You can even notch for it um, or notch with it. Now I drop the other one. If you get the extra advanced kit or buy one of these separate, this is what I call a notching flaker. And it's essentially, I'll put it up here so hopefully you can see if the camera will focus on it. There we go. It's another flaker. And you can just buy a regular flaker. It's the same cost, doesn't matter. Um, and you hammer the end flat. So essentially you're taking a normal flaker and you're turning it into a flathead screwdriver. Now, of course, you can't really use it as a screwdriver because it's copper and it'll just twist the screwdriver as opposed to the screw. But that's what we're using this for is notching. And you don't have to have this, but this does help. 
So again, when you buy the basic kit, it doesn't have the uh, the notching tool because you don't have to have it. But if you want to advance into this a little bit more, it's a good tool to have. And then also in the advanced kit is this little gem right here, if I can get the camera to focus on that. And this is what I call the little rascal. Now it's not pronounced rascal, it's called little rascal. And that's what I call that. But it's a fun little piece. So it's another little billet. And you don't have to have this. So this is the smaller of the other billets. You don't have to have it. But I've started using these little half inch billets. And it's just super, super handy. So if you're wanting to have a bunch of tools and kind of exploit all their different uses, it's good to have the notching tool and the little rascal. Uh, as I like to call it. It does help, but you don't have to have these. You can build everything without these, but they do kind of help. So I'm going to leave it up to you what, what you want to have. Now, some people when they make, I'll show you this quick. Some people when they make uh, flint napping tools, uh, they'll automatically start rounding them. So you'll buy them and they're rounded and I don't do that. I use the square edges and the reason for that is I actually prefer the square edge. I can get a much more precise hit. That's why when I sell them they're they're very square edged and I've heard a lot of people ask questions about that. Now over time obviously this one was brand new at some point they round themselves over because you're hitting this repeatedly and over amount of time it rounds itself out. Now that doesn't mean that this is useless. I mean we still use this all the time uh, but that's where when you do as much napping as I do if you have hundreds that you're going through or even dozens and dozens um, eventually you're going to start rounding these out. It's going to take you a long time to get to this but essentially you kind of evolve with the tool a little bit so it doesn't hurt if it's round and it doesn't hurt if it's square. Uh, there's many times that I prefer a square edge, like I said, because I can get a very precise hit because the point of impact is going to be right on this little square edge as opposed to this that's a little bit more round. And sometimes, but it's in, it's inevitable that you're going to take a square piece and over amount of time you're going to round it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes that's when the little rascal comes in handy because as you can see even though it's got a lot of wear on it, it's still much more square. So we can use this for some of our bigger reduction and then as we get down to when we need those little fine edges this is where this kind of comes in handy. So hopefully that didn't overwhelm you too much. Now that I've explained all the tools I want to work on going through the progression of some of these tools and I'm not going to use the new ones that I just showed you just simply because um, I want to show you that as you wear these things down, and this is my normal set, so I'm just going to, you know, use these as I normally would. I always pretty much start off with the abrader and knock things down a little bit. And again, it's to get rid of all the trashy stuff that's on the edge. If you hit it, like up here, let's use this as an example. I didn't abrade this, and if you hit this, I want you to see that right there. And we're going to let the camera focus in on it. You see how it's a whole bunch of little crap? That's what happens when you don't abrade. So you can't really run a flake very far if you don't abrade. It just knocks off a little junk along the way. Now, if we abrade that and knock off some of the little tiny micro flakes and really uh, stiffen that edge, then we can take the bigger bopper. And now, all of a sudden, we can run these beautifully long flakes. So abrading, as much as it's not really fun, and you don't have to sit here and abrade for three hours before you take a hit. It's literally like, just knock the stuff off till nothing's coming off. And then you can take a pretty good hit and knock a nice flake. So I typically do like to abrade in between almost every hit. Not you can see I'm knocking little stuff off, so that's what I was kind of doing. I was trying to get a long flake, and it wasn't running. It was just breaking, so I'm going to stop and re -abrade. and there we go. We got some nice big flakes. So that's part of the secret to actually thinning a piece. That's where a lot of people struggle in thinning. Now, if you know anything about flint napping whatsoever, 
And this is really hard to explain without drawing a big giant diagram, but it's what we call conchoidal fracture and everything everything fractures in a cone shape. Now this took me a long time to really wrap my head around because you think, well, if I hit it like this, where's the cone? This is from the very tip of where you hit is the little peak of the cone and the energy travels out in a cone shape, but this is only one micro side essentially of the cone. So if I hit it right here and this is the tip, I'm going to use a flaker to kind of point this. So if I hit it right here and this is the cone, the tip of the cone, the cone goes outwards like this. So obviously a cone gets smaller and smaller as you get to the top. So hopefully that little, I gotta put it where you can see it, I guess, huh? So the cone, if the tip is right here, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes. So you gotta imagine this big cone like this, and it comes right up to this little tiny spot right here. And what we're doing is we're essentially removing, we're not removing the whole cone because all this energy is being dispersed. But when we hit it here, it's removing a little side of that cone, if that makes any sense at all. And I know it took me a long time to get it, but you can kind of see it with this. You can see it when we hit it here, that it removes a flake here. And it's okay to kind of visualize it as these shit flat sheets of paper that come off, because it kind of is. But if you say you hit this piece right in the middle, which is just gonna shatter the piece, but what it's gonna do is it disper disperses energy from the very tip in a cone fashion. So if you had a great big piece of rock, if you hit it here, the, the cone would get wider and wider the further it goes out because you're displacing energy from here to here. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Like I said, it took me a while to understand it. After a while, when you remove flakes and you see that they break and they're all rounded, it'll start making so much more sense. And this is why I don't, like to teach the basics of flint napping because so many things are very difficult uh, to explain. Now that we know that, I've seen a lot of people, they'll take a piece of rock like this and they'll say, okay, I want to remove a flake over here and they're holding it like this and they're trying to hit it and knock it off and that doesn't work because the cone, if you hit it here trying to shear a piece off, the cone is actually running all the way onto the both sides. So if you do manage to actually break it, all you're going to do is essentially just blow up the whole piece of rock. It can break anywhere. So what we're doing is we're turning the, we're turning the piece on its side and we're going to braid it off. And when we hit it in a downward angle, just on the very edge right here like this, we're using the cone not facing straight down, but the cone is going off to the side and we're removing just the one side of the cone, like that. And any of these pieces that you pick up and look at, let the camera focus here a second, if it'll do it, will have curvature. Do you see how that has a curve to it, a natural curve? That's because cones are not straight lines. They wrap and they're constantly curving all the way around. So the energy that we're getting off of these is curving around. Uh, the rock on every single hit. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Like I said, you're going to have to put tools to rock in practice to learn what you're doing. Now, all that being said, another little crash course on this is I want you to, now that you understand the cone thing, maybe a teeny tiny bit, I want you to envision, this is tough, I want you to envision uh, this rock as a whole flat of paper. You know how if you go buy a whole flat of like printer paper, it's just all this paper stacked. And as you remove paper, obviously the stack gets smaller, right? It perf makes perfect sense. So when we look at this as being in a stack of paper, what we're trying to do is removing sheets of paper at a time. So all these high spots like over here, you can tell, is much higher than in the middle. So in order to thin this piece, we have to remove essentially sheets of paper, which is, again, little cones coming off the side, but we're going to call it sheets of paper uh, for this 
instructional purpose. But as we remove these, that's what's going to make it thinner. Now, if you run right in here to the middle and decide that's it, I'm going to hit here and try to remove them all at once, it's not going to work. It's either A, going to break the piece, or it's going to come in here. It's going to make what we call a step fracture or a hinge, and you're not going to actually be able to remove these outside pieces efficiently because essentially that's the product of just being impatient. So what we need to do is keep in mind the places that are high, like on this, we need to remove these outside edges before we ever decide that we're going to move, remove these places that are dipped in. So you can obviously tell if this is a flat of paper, we're going to get to this sheet long before we get to this sheet. You can see the distance here. So if you're like, cool, I'm going to remove stuff here, it's going to fight you the whole way because you need to remove this to release this, if that makes any sense whatsoever. This is always very difficult to explain. So, that being said, what we need to do is build a platform that is on the side of the rock that we want to remove the material. Okay, so hang with me here. If you, again, look at it like sheets of paper and take right in the center of the sheet of paper and draw an imaginary line right down the center of this, now obviously this is on the outside edge and this is the furthest edge that we have and luckily we have a tiny little platform right here and a platform is something that kind of jets out further than everything else and as long as it's on this side we can remove a flake from this side of the rock if the platform is on this side from center we can remove it from this side. But if you have a platform on this side and you try to hit it to go this way, you're not going to be able to get that flake to remove because simply you can't run a long flake. What will happen is instead of hitting it here and removing a long flake, you'll hit it here trying to go this way and it can't run all the way across the whole piece. So you're only going to get a flake that runs along the top. And that, so I'm not saying you'll never see me hit one this way, and if I do, it's because I'm trying to actually develop a platform to hit it this way. So here's what I want to do. I know this is, again, very difficult to understand. You can see how the platform is favoring, or it's raised, on this side, because our platform is here. So we have all our sheets of paper and blah, 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 and here's the center line right at the tip of my flaker. So this one, we want to remove the flake off this side, so we need to turn it down show you that again that's the one we want to remove so we turn it down and we're gonna hit right there but we're gonna do it with our billet so go ahead and abrade it off to stiffen the platform and we see how we just removed that flake in fact what I should do is get it back I don't know if it's the same flake or not hopefully it is it is so I just showed this to you that this was the platform and there you go. You see how we just essentially removed sheets of paper in that flat? And that's the basics of flint napping and thinning. Now, if you want to follow this down the rest of the way, obviously it's higher on this side, so we need to remove this material. Now, one little nugget of information. I'll t turn this around several ways so you can see it but there's a cup in here. It's very cupped, opposite of what my hand is right now, but it's cupped in here. Now, if you try to run into this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna, like if you try to braid this off and take a big hit to drive a flake, it's gonna come into about here, here, and it's going to step fracture and prohibit this flake from traveling further. So anything that's cupped like this, you have to remove the outer edge of that cup. So again, if the cup's here, we're gonna face it down. And then we're gonna take, and instead of taking a big hit, we're actually going to what we call batter, which is we're just crushing the edge. We're not hitting it hard. We're just breaking the edge and making a whole bunch of this little trash. And we are eliminating that cup essentially and so while it still is cupped here our platform is actually moved from this side where it's cupped over 
to this side. Do you see that right here? So before it was over here and it was cupped and we battered that edge off. So every time that you remove material off this side, it's raising the platform on this side. So this is some of the big secrets to flint napping. This is the, the basics of it. It's very, very, very important to say when you want to build a platform, say to remove a flake, and this is a, a great example right here, is there is a flake that's right here. It's very kind of hard to see probably from where you're at, but there's right here, there's a flake that needs to be removed but the platform is actually right on center. Um, you can see it kind of jogs to this side over here and then it comes back but it's not quite to this side it kind of runs right down the center. So what we need to do is we take our billet and we're gonna take the opposite direction so actually the side that we want to remove material on believe this or not this is the part that hangs a lot of people up say sure we want to put this down we want to hit but the problem is we can't right now because the platform's on the other side so what we're going to do is turn it over the other way and we're going to batter the edge and what we're doing is we're building a platform which we just did so hopefully if you need to rewind it and go look at what we were talking about it was over here the, the platform either ran down the center or favored this side and by battering pieces off we raised the platform to favor this side. So now we can put that down. What we'll do is we'll find the a braider I dropped, braid it off, because now we're trying to actually drive a flake. So this is the side we want to remove. So we're gonna we're gonna face the piece down, always removing flakes off the bottom. And we're gonna hit it on that side. Now the the angle in which you hit takes time to learn. It takes a long time to really learn what angle to hit a piece of rock. If you hit it straight on, obviously you're not removing the cone, you're dispersing the cone throughout. If it's too flat, all you're going to do is get these little tiny pieces. So you have to rock this piece back and meet it somewhere in the middle. And this simply just takes practice. There's, there's pretty much no uh, alternative to putting your hands on tools and hands on a rock. And quite frankly, you if you're gonna take up flint napping, you have to be willing to say, hey, I'm not gonna buy a kit and buy a little box of rock and for $100 at the end of it, I'm gonna be able to make arrowheads. And that's, that's, a, that's a hard pill for some people to swallow. The reality is you're probably gonna buy a $100, $200 box of rock and just blow every single piece up. You're going, but you're going to learn something along the way. You're probably, in all honesty, going to be two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500 invested into rock before you actually produce stuff that you're going to be like, now that really looks like an arrowhead. But that's just normal. I mean, that's just, we all have gone through it. But you don't think that when you start. You're thinking, well, I'm going to buy like two pounds of rock and by the end of it I'll have it figured out I'll be able to make an arrowhead. Some people are fast learners and they sort it out but your average person is going to end up blowing up a lot of rock and you need to accept that because you're learning a trade you're learning a skill this is not something that just comes super easy if it was super easy everybody would do it but it is very very challenging. So anyway we've removed a lot off this side and it actually has, because originally when we were looking at it, we were looking at it from this side and we were removing a bunch of stuff over here. And we did that and by removing this off this side, we raised the platform and now we're actually ready to remove stuff on this side of the rock. So again, you can see that the center line kind of runs right down and then it jogs off to this side just a little bit and then it comes back and it makes this perfect little platform right there. So we'll abrade that off and then there we go got a nice little flake ran right across there we'll abrade it off kind of keep battering that out and although it's not very good you can see that we're kind of maintaining a nice center line now and we'll be able to come back to this now the best thing we can do is flip this rock over and say look at this mess that we have here and as much as we want to remove this what we would call a turtle back 
which it's flat on this side, but it is kind of rounded on this side, and we need to remove this. So as, many, as much as we like to say, well, we're just gonna start hitting on this and trying to drive flakes across, our platform favors the flat side, and that's very normal in flint napping. So what happens is people think, well, you can see it's got this turtle back. You can see how flat it is here and how rounded it is here. And if you wanna remove this, people are like, okay, well, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before, and I'm gonna set it here, and I'm gonna start hitting it. But the problem is, is this center line is on this side. It is heavily on this side. So if you're thinking about the flat of play paper again, let's do that and run a center line right down through the center. You're gonna be looking at like right here is the center line. So our platform is heavily on this side. So to think that you're gonna be able to remove this big rounded turtle back section from hitting it here, it's not going to go. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit it on that side so you can see that it's not going to go because sometimes it's important to show people that it's not gonna work. What it does is it drives in and makes it worse. So you have to accept that your arrowhead or your atlatl point is not gonna be this big. Okay, you, that's just not how this works. You have to remove material from the sides to get it thin. So what we're gonna do is remove more material on this side so we can take material off to get rid of this turtle back. So what we're gonna do is flip it around. Here's the flat side. We're gonna put the flat side down. Okay, and now we are going to batter. Not trying to remove big flakes, but what we're trying to do is remove a whole bunch of little trash right off this side because remember when we remove flakes off the bottom or remove flakes off any side it raises the platform so we haven't raised it enough yet but you can see that now the center line is getting a little bit more towards the center where as opposed to before it was way over here we're moving material off and that moves the center line up. So I'm gonna remove a little bit more here and a little bit more here. And actually we're getting to a point where we can actually try to drive a couple of longer flakes off of here. So, and I'm actually gonna switch, because this is a smaller piece, I wanted to start with the bigger bill to show you, but we're gonna switch to the smaller one. Usually when you're working a bigger, a bigger spall overall is when you want the big one. So we're gonna switch to the smaller billet and I'm gonna go ahead and knock a couple of those and if they start turning choppy, make sure you abrade it. There we go. All right, camera kinda, kinda timed out on us there a little bit, so hopefully we didn't miss too much of this, but I removed these flakes off this side with the little billet and uh, we started to flatten this edge out, so hopefully you can see that. And of course, every time we remove material off the side, again, it raises the platform for the other side. Now we're getting relatively flat up in here. Now we still have a little high spot here and a little high spot here. So we're gonna braid those off and take some little flakes. And these are just, they're not big walloping hits. They're just very direct. And what I'm doing is I'm hitting a very, very, very tiny little edge. You see this little edge right here? Just the tip of this. We abrade that off, and that is what's going to remove. You can see the, the little precipice of this, of this piece of rock. It's not like I just hit this big giant piece and knocked it off. It's, it starts as just this tiny little tip, and then the energy wave goes down through and shears this off. So, again, everything that we remove from one side automatically raises the platform for the other side. I cannot stress that enough. So what I'm doing right now is I'm gonna braid that off and I'm actually battering this edge because remember our turtle back that's over here on this side because we flipped it around. We're more flat on this side. Here's the turtle back is we're trying to remove material off the side that's flat so we can get a platform to remove the big rounded turtle back. 
And so I think we've done that. I'm turning it around now because now I'm ready to hit on the other side. So now you can see the turtle back on this side. It's flat on this side, but you can see just right here I raised the platform, which used to be on this side, and then I shifted the platform over to now I actually have enough I can probably hit and start removing that turtle back. And it's not giving me good flakes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. I'm going to braid it off good. I'm going to find a new little tiny platform, and I'll hit it. And see, there's a piece that came off. It wasn't a big, beautiful piece, but... All right, now, what I want to do, I'm going to kind of stop midstream here because we're getting kind of close to tip. Not terribly important. We're going to take pressure flaker and we're going to set up a platform using the pressure flaker. Now, if this is the side that we want to take the flake off because of the turtle back, we need to remove flakes from here going this way. So we lay this side down and what I'm doing is essentially grabbing onto the rock with the flaker and I'm pushing down and chipping rock off. So you're getting all these little chips and it does take, it, I know it doesn't look like much, but it does take a fair amount of wrist and forearm strength to do this. And it does take time. I see a lot of people, they push on it and they're just not getting anything. There's a certain technique to grabbing the edge and you kind of roll your wrist. I tend to rock back, as you'll see this in the future. I tend to rock back on the point like this with my thumb and then I put the flaker in and then as I rock the two together, I break them away. And that gives me a little bit more rev leverage. And I don't always do that, but typically if I'm trying to, to drive a long flake, you see me rock this back and put this on the edge. And it typically happens really fast. So fast that you probably don't even realize I've done it. <laughs> see if that makes sense to you. See how I'm leaning that back and I'm getting a hold of it? And by removing these little choppy flakes off this side, it's the same as when we're battering it, but we're doing it with a flaker, we've raised the platform now to this side. So let me hunt my, hunt my tool down now that I dropped it. So our platform is on this side here. So we're going to lay that side down. And we have a nice little platform here and a nice little platform here. And then we knock that flake off. There's one right next to it, so we'll get that one. And now here's a nice big platform where this kind of this turtle back is right here, you can see. So we're going to hit on this platform and try to knock that off. Mm, very nice. A little one there, little one there, little one there. Braid it off. So we're right back to kind of, now we're actually thinning this piece out. It's actually is starting to look pretty good, right? So but we haven't done anything with the back or this back turtle back, but the tip in general is actually starting to get fairly even. It's actually starting to resemble the tip of an arrowhead, right? So that's the problem with sitting here working in this. You drop all your tools. Um, what I'm probably gonna do now is I'm gonna take the pressure flaker. I don't have to do it. You don't have to do it right now, but sometimes I like to be really uniform in what I'm working. And I have a little bit more, let's see, let's camera. You can see that this center line that runs favors this side more than this side, right? So the center line really should be at the very, very tip of my flaker, should be just off to the side a little tiny bit, and it's not, it's off to this side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna pressure flake this off. Again, we take the side that the platform is on, we lay it down, and we're going to push those flakes off. I'm leaning it back, I'm getting hold of it, and I rock it together. And you don't normally expect to get super big, long flakes from pressure flaking. What pressure flaking is doing is taking little flakes anywhere from a quarter of an inch to maybe on the long side. You, I mean, you could get some long ones if you have a really nice platform. But for the most part, you're looking at, you know, three-eighths to a half an inch long little flakes. Now... <clears throat> We're going to come back to this little turtle back on the back side. See, so let's flip it over. This is our point that we just worked. 
Gotta flip it over and you see how this side's really raised up. This side's relatively flat. Again, we're still kind of rounded on this side. So if we're looking at our sheets of paper, we have to remove these outside edges before we remove anything down lower on the inside. So, gonna braid that off. Now this is a very good point to show you right here. This is almost, it's not quite a 90 degree angle, <clears throat> but it's almost a 90 degree angle. You can see how this comes straight up and almost over. I mean, it's probably like, it's probably like a 94 degree angle or something. It's off center, whatever it is. And if you try to hit directly on this 90 degree angle, it's either if you hit it steep enough, it's just gonna remove these little tiny flakes, or if you hit it hard enough, it's going to go in and then step fracture. So, unfortunately, if you turn this over and say, look, oh, you know what, here, let's do this. I'm gonna intentionally mess it up and hopefully not break it completely. You see how I get these little choppy ones? And actually there's nowhere to even hit. It's just, it's not gonna go. So when you set this thing down to hit, there's, there's nothing here. You're gonna hit the top edge of this before you ever hit the bottom edge. So if that's the case, what you have to do is start going to the edges and saying, well, here's a platform and here's a platform. And instead of working it right on this platform, you have to zigzag or walk your right way around from the corner around the back of the piece. Now here's a nice little platform. So we're gonna turn it over and see how we can get this nice long little flake. Beautiful. Same, there's another one right there. Now, braid it off again. And always remember after one or two hits to stop in a braid. And I'm not, notice I've never, I've never cocked way back and smacked the crap out of this thing. That's what you maybe do with some big giant pieces. For the most part, this is like little, little wrist taps. If you hit it that hard and it doesn't release, it's because you either didn't hit it where you were supposed to, or the angle was wrong. So if you just sit here and just, in hitting it, it's, I mean, that one released, but if you're just sitting here just beating on it and it's not going anywhere, it's because you either your angle is wrong or you don't have a defined platform. But if you're hitting it like here and it's not going and you just wail on it, you're just gonna break the piece. So you have to, have to show some patience. So now what I'm gonna do is I think I've explained the basics of this to you fairly well. I'm gonna just true up the sides. And that's the thing too, is if you take a hit and it doesn't release the flake, after a while you start rocking, you can do these little choppy flakes and they're not removing anything and you start rocking the, the uh, biface, that's what this is called, the point into it. And eventually, even hitting it small, you'll turn it enough that it hits and actually removes a little flake. So as I'm hitting these, and I'm barely grazing the edge, it's not releasing, but I'll turn this in ever so slightly right up until it does. So I'm gonna stop right here, and I might be pretty steep, and I'll hit it, it's not going. I'll keep rocking the piece of rock into it until I get the flake that removes. Just like that. So there we go. So sometimes you'll see where I don't just take one hit, I'll take a little series and I'll just kind of rock it in a little bit closer every single time. Okay. Now on this back side, we're still at this 90 degree angle. It looks you know, it's very, very, it's a tough spot. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move flake off this side, then this side, then this side, then this side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it down. And you can see right here, I've moved the platform now to this side of the rock. And now we get a flat, uh, you know, we're still our 90 degrees here, but if you follow it around to the edge, now the platform's on this side. I'll have to put that edge down remove a flake or two. Oh, got one more I could probably do. And what we did by doing that, by, re by removing that, is we moved the platform from what was on this side of the rock 
now to that side of the rock. Because remember, when you remove a flake off one side, it raises the platform on the other. And now we flip it over and we hit it that way. It looks like we got eh, probably one more. That's a pretty good one. But again, as we remove flakes off the bottom, it raises the platform. So what we're going to do is braid it off and then flip it over. Oh, and then hit it on that side. Now, unfortunately, this happens all too often. <laughs> you get really invested and you break it in half. Now, you've seen me do that, and that doesn't hurt my feelings because, quite honestly, it just happens. It happens all the time. But what we're going to do is I'm going to catch up another biface probably to this point. But that's important to see, especially when you hit on the back of a piece. Like the sides, you always run the risk of breaking it when you hit from the sides. But when you're working the back of a piece, you stand a much higher chance of breaking a piece in half. And I, I want you to... I'm actually kind of ha glad it happened in a certain way as much as I was making progress. Because everybody breaks rock. Everybody. It just... It's part of flint napping. Like they say is you ain't if you ain't uh, you ain't making if you ain't breaking is what they say. So I can actually still get a little arrowhead out of this one, but I'm gonna save that for another time. And this is probably a wonderful time to take a little break. Uh, I may move on to the second part of the video, but I may not. I may just catch up another one to where we're getting right down to this triangle shape because we are almost to the point of pressure flaking it into a point so we were getting to the shape and we worked mostly through all the bifacing with uh, percussion and as soon as we were just about ready to get rid of that last little 90 degree spot we were going to finish this point up so anyway I'm going to work on a new one don't ever be discouraged if you base break a piece of rock at the end of the day it's a piece of rock. Is it expensive rock? Kind of. It's not a precious gemstone, but at the end of the day, it's a piece of rock. Throw it down, grab a new piece, because you learn something every single time you break one. So let me get another one caught up to this point, and it kind of makes me happy to see that even Ryan Gill is fallible. He breaks rock, and then we're going to keep going from here. Hang with us. All right, well, since I broke the other one, and I have to make a new one. This has given me an opportunity almost to show you how fast an experienced napper. Hold on a second. I could work through a piece of rock because after you put in a very, very long time of flint napping, you'll be able to move, remove material extremely fast. So what, what probably already took me, you know, 40 minutes in detailed instruction to remove I am able to remove this here in just a couple minutes like mostly the my percussion napping doesn't take that long once you're experienced percussion napping goes actually relatively fast usually you know between five and ten minutes and so here in real time which is really just going to be a couple minutes I'm going to work this out but you have to keep in mind I have been flint napping for well over a decade, and I also have more practice than your, say, your average guy that's been napping a decade, because I do this for a living. I make stone points by the hundreds every single year for people to hunt with. That's not including the uh, stone knives and stuff like that that I make, but just hunting points in general. So I have a ridiculous amount of experience. So I don't want you to look at this and say, wow, in one month, I'm going to be able to pick up a piece of rock and just beat it into shape the way that Ryan Gill does. But I want to give some perspective into that. This is this would be comparative to say, like, I don't play piano. I can play a couple little things on the piano, and I'm musically inclined. But just learning to play piano, it's like you start working on just, like, little chord progressions and... and it's a very, very slow process. You don't just jump into it and, and play, um, you know, a Beethoven piece or a big intricate classical piece the second you start playing piano. It takes years and years and years before you can just, you're, you're naturally trained with muscle memory to be able 
to create that music. And it's really the same thing with flint napping, where you're not just going to pick up a rock and pick up a tool and start beating on it and turn it into something. It's I have a ton of mu muscle memory, and uh, I can look at an angle and pretty much know in probably a fraction of a second if I am capable of removing a flake from it. But in real time, this gives me the opportunity to show you how fast we should be able to actually biface with production. So what took me, you know what, 40 minutes or an hour or a half hour, I don't even know how long it took me to show you how to reduce that piece. I'm going to do it here within just a couple minutes. And we're going to remove some big old flakes doing it too. Almost there. We're almost caught right back up to where we were before. So you're looking at like literally five minutes from spall to a a piece that's ready to pressure flake or ready to micro uh, percussion nap. So what has taken me, you know, probably an hour or so to teach, realistically, I am uh, able to produce in, in like like usually say five to ten minutes and I'm not afraid to break a piece like I said before it's just rock and I, I know you all sat through that for a long time and thought wait well, he worked on that for an hour and then it broke that's devastating but the reality is you just see me working this again I'm you know five and a half minutes deep into this so for me to sit on a normal working day to work a piece like this and then spend five minutes and it breaks it's like no big deal let's go grab another piece of rock and I continue on so anyway we're pretty much exactly back where we were when I snapped the other one in half <laughs> and we're at almost nine minutes so Again, it's not the end of the world, see? So I'm gonna continue to thin this down a little bit more and when I get it just to the point that I'm ready to pressure flake, I'm gonna let you know. But anyway, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch to our little friend here called the Little Rascal. Remember, it's called a Little Rascal, not Rascal, because Rascal sounds funnier. And it's just a little billet. It's doing the same thing that the other one was but I'm removing these little micro flakes. Now I am a lap napper. Some people don't nap on their lap. I do, but I don't primary. I don't. I don't completely nap on my lap. It depends on the rock I'm using. Some rocks are more difficult. Sometimes I will find a piece that's just not being removed on my lap. I talk about this in some of my advanced videos, but I just want to let you know a little bit about it. Well take especially this little guy here or a little antler billet and I do it freehand and I knock it just like that and remove a flake okay let's we'll see if you can see that again okay and I catch it with my finger and nap it off now it's a, a little experienced napping technique but I wanted to explain why it's all taking place on my lap right now and not uh, freehand like you'll see other people doing it. I I am com almost completely self-taught. Of course I picked up some tips and tricks along the way from other people and uh, but primarily at the end of the day I learned to do this really organically. It was when I started napping it was before there was before YouTube even existed and you essentially, if you wanted to learn, you learned from you went and saw somebody do it one time, or uh, you went to the same show where there was one guy napping. That's how it was for me when I first got started. I'd show up to an archery tournament, and there was like one guy who would sit there and make arrowheads. And he wasn't very talkative, uh, but I would watch him do it, and I got a very strong interest in it. And he handed me a piece of rock and said, this is how you do it. And said, get you a piece of deer antler and do it like this. And I said, okay. And I went home and I could not do it. And I got frustrated for years. I was still 
very young teenager. And it wasn't until years later that I got the strength um, and had kind of the mental capacity to say, I'm trying to remove rock. And I still sucked when I started. And I had kind of a, a couple years head start, at least in knowing how the process worked. But, uh, well, anyway, see here. I'm going to get back to some instruction here in one second. In fact, I'm going to start the video over because we're about to time out. Hold on. Alright, so we're looking at our center line. And if we're, again, looking at sheets of paper, right, and platforms, if you, I'm going to rock this back and forth because I want you to see it. There's a platform right here, and I mean it is a phenomenal platform right there. You can see now the center line. Because center line here is like gorgeous, right? I mean, it's like almost a straight line. Then it comes over and goes all the way over, and then it comes back. So that is your, like, ideal, awesome platform. Now, if you cock back and just smack the crap out of this to remove this little high spot, you're just going to break the crap out of this point, right? Now, you can uh, take it. Now, I've switched sides, so it's on this side because I'm going to face it down. You can take it and pressure flake some of this off, but this is a pretty decent little platform. And this is, again, what I'm going back to on the micro um, what I call micro percussion and if you just hold this thing and hit it there's a very good chance like I did on the last one because I'm an idiot and talking while I'm doing it instead of paying attention to what I'm doing you snap this thing right here and I don't want to do that so either A I'm going to end up holding it with a little bit of tension not, I'm not clamping down I'm giving a little bit of tension on the back where it can rock almost freely and I'm going to hit it very gently like that okay see how lightly I hit that and I remove that flake and then I'm going to braid it off and I'm gonna do the same thing I'm gonna help hold it not up here back here and rock this back and then one little tiny tap so this is it's it's hard not to want to just grab a piece and beat the crap out of it that's how you break things in half that's how I broke the last one in half because I'm running my mouth trying to explain this stuff instead of concentrating on what I'm doing the reality is if you really concentrate you can knock these little tiny little flakes off very very safely so I'm gonna come back there's another platform here I'm gonna do the same thing okay now this it, see how I'm hitting this and it doesn't want to go most people's tendency is, oh, it didn't go. So I'm just, gonna, I'm gonna hit harder and harder, and then I blew the whole thing up. That's just, I see that people get really impatient. So this is really important. So we're hitting here. It doesn't want to let go. We're gonna take our pressure flaker, flip the piece. So here's the spot that we want to do. I'll keep my piece on. Flip it over. Okay. This is the platform I was hitting on. Now what we want to do is remove flakes off this side off the bottom because we are remember every time you remove a flake you're raising a platform so what we're doing is we're removing flakes and releasing that spot that's right there and then we're going to braid it off flip it back over now we have a little bit better of a platform and looky there popped right off it was that simple so instead of just hitting it harder and harder and harder and harder Take a hit, and that's why this is a fun little nugget of information. I don't have a lot of basis of experience on this myself, uh, but one of the things that, that uh, my archaeologist good friend Morgan Smith has pointed out is a lot of times what they see in some of the, not all the times, but some of the times see in the archaeological record is that women are actually buried with the flint napping tools which would signify that you have a lot of women that are doing the flint napping and it might actually be because women are less likely to take a piece and try to smash it into submission women are, are very much wired that's why a lot of times women are very good rifle shots because they're not trying to force stuff they're very uh, delicate and steady 
and um, what we might call technique oriented. So they're going to look at this and instead of being male oriented like me where I want to smash the crap out of this thing because I want to remove this flake, they're going to look at it and they're going to hit it. And if it doesn't remove the flake that they want, they're going to flip it over and they're very patient little beings as women usually are and they're going to remove flakes off the one side and then they're going to say okay well that looks much better and they'll take these little tiny hits and that's one of the really important things I want you to take from flint napping in general is we don't want to ever force the rock to do what we want it to do because if we force it you are 90 Five ninety-nine. I don't know what the real percentage is. I'm just saying that because that's what I want to say. Essentially, you stand a, an ex exceptionally great chance of exploding the rock if you're just trying to force it into submission. One of the best things you can do is do like I'm doing right now, is you take a pressure flaker and you build a platform all the way up and down where because right now what I was doing is I want to remove this side of the rock so I'm build, I'm removing flakes here to build the platform and then you very gently remove the flakes so these get these tiny little flakes that come off now as much as I like to use my big billets and smack the crap out of a piece of rock because to me, percussion napping is fun. That's where it's at. That's why I actually wanted to use the the micro percussion because I prefer to actually hit a piece of rock as opposed to pressure flaking it. But at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're really to a point on this piece of rock that it's time to really, for the most part, I'm not saying we'll never come back to this, but we need to drop it on the floor because now it's really just time to pressure flake using the pressure flaker <clears throat> and I'm not always again rocking it back super far now if I've got a big flake that I'm trying to remove like right here is a good one I'm really gonna rock this back I'm gonna analyze it I'm gonna put my flaker right on the edge and I'm gonna push in the idea is you're trying to push in and then you break it away as you go down so you're going in and down and if you're just doing these little flakes you essentially can just hold this with your thumb and kind of, I kind of roll like this, if that makes sense. So I'll come in, I'll put it on, and then I roll and push down. And I can break these little flakes away. And I'm not grabbing way up high. I'm grabbing just right on the little edge. And if it doesn't grab really good, again, that's where you come in with the abrader. Make sure you abrade it off good because if you find a spot, let's say here, that's not well abraded and you do it, it just it, it won't grab. It just crumbles these little tiny edges. But once you abrade it, you can grab these little pieces and just pop them off. Now here, I'm going to try to get a better flake. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rock it back pretty heavy. And I'm going to line this up really where I'm going to put that flaker right where I want it. And I'm already pushing. And they're actually like this right now. I'm going to push them together really good, pretty hard. And it does take practice and you're using muscles you don't normally use so don't expect to be able to do it good right off the bat and then I'm going to roll these two together and then push off with the flager see just like that and see how I ran I almost ran it I actually got an overshoot and I have a nice little callus right there on my thumb you see that and if I didn't have that callus, I would have actually just jammed that flint flake into my finger. So, again, I don't cut myself very often. My hands are extremely calloused. I do this for a living. I build hundreds of these things a year. So, it's not a big deal for that to hit me. Because what we did is we shot an overshoot off. And that little flake right there would have just jammed into my... I've done it before. I've gotten a city... Like, I have scars here where I've jammed sharp rocks into there if you are making broad making arrowheads you're gonna break them and you're gonna cut yourself that's inevitable once you get to a point where um, you are used to doing it and your hands are adjusted to it you won't cut yourself very often at all now a lot of people are sitting there saying 
why aren't you wearing gloves? You can do that. Because if you're working with these big bulky gloves, quite honestly, you're not you're never going to get the precision in the feel that you are going to do get barehanded if you work with gloves all the time. So this is the disclaimer on this. You're going to cut yourself. You're going to you're going to cut yourself pretty good. You're going to have to take tweezers and pull pieces of rock out of you because um the flit napping isn't for little crybabies. It's it's for people that aren't afraid to get a cut. I mean, it's not a big deal to jam a piece of rock into you. Quite frankly, you need to go into this knowing you're going to end up bleeding. And then once you've done it as long as I have, you've got these these calluses that are massive. I mean, it takes a heck of a heck of a flake of rock to get into this callus. It's phenomenally thick. And uh, some folks even say too, why aren't you wearing safety glasses? And that is a good thing. I think I think a lot of folks should wear safety glasses. Um, I would never advise anybody not to wear safety glasses. And oftentimes if you nap indoors, you can run into problems with silicosis, which is every time you hit this, there's like little fine dust particles that come off this. And if you breathe that in over an amount of time, like I do, you can uh, eventually have enough of the silica in your lungs that uh, can cause some major damage to you. Now, whenever I nap inside, I'm not doing it today because I'm trying to film a video so I can survive one day. Uh, but I have a fan right over here on this side of me, and the fan is always running and blowing this off if I'm napping inside. But a lot of times I nap outside where I have a nice little breeze. So keep that in mind as well. And then as far as the safety glasses go, uh, while I do recommend many people wear safety glasses, that's a great thing because sometimes you'll have a chip that comes up. Typically my method of napping in your lap does not produce flakes that come back to me. Where when you're doing a lot of freehand napping or you're pressure flaking like this in your lap, you get flakes that shoot back to you. I don't have that happen. Have I ever had that happen and flakes come to me on a freak thing? Absolutely. But, and I wouldn't use contacts as a fail safe, but I wear contact lenses. So I would never advise you to say, hey, well, I wear contacts, so it's not a big deal. But essentially, if you wear contacts and you get a little chip that flies up and lands in your eye, your contact will catch it. So if you're really good at not not uh, blinking you can go in the house you can wash all the stone off your hands clean up really good and then pull the contact out rinse the uh, stone flake off and stick it back in that's essentially what I do so that's why I don't wear contacts and if I ever go you ever see me at a show or a nap in and I'm not wearing uh, safety glasses it's because I'm actually quite confident that if I do get uh, a rock chip in there. It's not a big deal. Usually I've got contact solution pretty close. I pop my contact out. I rinse everything. My fingers, the contact off really good and I stick it back in my eye and keep going. Do I recommend everybody else do that? Not really, but that's that's me. So if you're going to do this, I do recommend eye protection and then also make sure that you are in a very well ventilated area because nobody wants to succumb to silicosis. So all that stuff covered, all the uh, disclaimer nonsense that's going to get me sued by somebody that cut themselves or breathed in flint dust, uh, we'll get back onto this. So essentially what I'm doing, now that I've got this really down to a nice triangle, now it's just pressure flaking. And the basics of pressure flaking are exactly the same as percussion. They're, what we're doing though is we're just grabbing an edge and we're breaking it off, off the bottom. So remember I told you? So instead of hitting it, we're very precise. But instead of trying to drive these flakes that are this long, essentially now we're just driving flakes that are this long. So we're doing the same exact thing. It's the basics of flint napping is building platforms and abrading the edge and removing the flake. So you can see on this side we're actually pretty good. We have a little tiny turtle back right here. So Unfortunately, what we need to do is if we want to remove this turtle back, we have to make our point smaller, which is not a problem. This one's actually quite large. So we're going to remove flakes off of this side in a downward angle to build a platform. 
to remove off the other side. So remember, remember the battering we did? It was just little short choppy strokes like that. Hold on, one second. I gotta wet the whistle a second. It's I'm doing a lot of talking. So all those short choppy battery flakes that we did to build a platform. Now what we do is we're removing just we're not rocking back to drive a flake. We're just pushing straight down. We're removing flakes off the bottom of the piece to raise the platform. And I'm actually, it's like I already know how far I have to go down, but I recommend you remove a, a few and then kind of look at it. And then what I'll kind of do too is, oddly enough, be proactive in this. Just because you want to remove off this side and you have to remove little choppy flakes, if you come down a little bit and you're like, oh, well, here's a little spot. I could I could take a longer flake out of that. I braid it off. And again, you're killing two birds with one stone. Sure, we want to build the platform on this side, but I got a little flake here that really needs to come off. So I'm just going to grab that and yank that off really fast. I got two or three of those in here. Perfect. And then we're right back to just raising our platform. So it's just strategic flake removal. Okay, I think I think overall we're almost to like a kind of a, a really tight center line. But you can see on this side, I'm going to point it out right here. There's a silly little spot there we got to get rid of. And then over here, we can really... We don't have to, but we want to make this a really nice point, so we need to get rid of some of this little turtle back. It's right here. You can see it's very flat on this side and very rounded on this side. So what I want to do is I'm going to remove just a teeny tiny few more on this side, and I'm almost going to grind it off. This is a, another little thing, too. It's like the battering, but instead of using the very tip of the flaker, what we're going to use is the side. And we're just going to roll it and grind it off. If it wants to come off easy, we're going to let it come. If it doesn't want to come off easy, we're not going to force it. But it's going to raise the platform to remove flakes off, obviously, the top side when it's when it's time. Now, this is one thing you're going to notice too, is when you finally get to where the platform is kind of built, but you have maybe one more you want to remove, it doesn't want to grab because everything is essentially you've abraded it with the flaker but you're like oh well I have one more here I want to remove if you try to and it's just sliding off if you try too hard you're gonna snap the tip off so you have to be able to look at this and say I have a little spot and you're probably not even gonna be really be able to see it but I have a teeny tiny little spot right here that I really want to remove a flake off of before I go on this side and if I push it I'm gonna snap it it's gonna snap literally right here so instead be patient remove off this side because remember we were just spending this whole time trying to remove this turtle back so I'm going to remove this turtle back and then when I'm done I'm gonna come back and then remove that one little flake so a lot of this again is an exercise in patience if you try to do it all at once, you're just going to break it. So this is one of those things where I want you to almost go in, especially when it comes to, to pressure flaking, I want you to approach pressure flaking like you're a woman that has delicate hands. That's the best way that I know to describe it because if you power through it you are going to break it you need to look at it as technique a gentle touch and a removal of flakes and again that's probably why there was there was probably a lot more female flint nappers than we give credit for now i do have and i mean the woman at the, the women at the time probably had phenomenal little muscles here and in their forearms um more so than we're used to today but for the most part the technique builds the muscle and 
the muscle memory builds the technique. So I'm removing actually these fairly decent little flakes just it, with very little pressure. I'm just rocking back. I'm finding the perfect little tiny platform and I roll it together and knock these little flakes off. That one didn't go very good. So it wasn't a good example. Just roll back. And if you have to force it too hard, like if, if you're grinding into it, then your platform is not well established. Now I'm not saying you should just be able to just and knock it right off. Like it does take pressure, but it's technique and pressure. You don't hear me grunting and strutting. And if you drop it, you stand a, de a decent chance of breaking it if you're on a concrete floor. Luckily, I just nipped the teeny tiny tip off, which is fine because I'm going to fix it. But if you're if you're struggling and cramming this thing into your finger every time, your platform is not well established. You have to establish your platform if you want to remove good flakes. I'm guilty of this, I'm not going to lie. I see a nice little platform like this and I want to hit it. <laughs> I want to hit it with the billet. And sometimes it works out, I'm not going to lie, but you can see how thin we're getting on this piece. It's, it's where it needs to be. This is where patience, remember what I was talking about, that gentle touch, you look at what needs to be done. I want to hit this so bad because I can knock a nice, almost like a little flute off of this side and thin this base. But if I force it and hit that, there's a very good chance it will literally break right about here. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. What I want you to do, instead of actually removing off the, remember this side we want actually want to remove, what I want to do as much as the platform's already built, we're going to pressure flake even more off this side and, and establish this platform as much as we possi possibly can. So, what it's almost like that, gra remember I was talking about using the side of your flaker? Where we kind of roll it and just crush the edge. That's what I'm doing. Now I'm not forcing it. I'm going to crush everything off that wants to come off. If it doesn't want to just come off on its own, I'm not going to fight it. Now, just because it comes off easy doesn't mean I'm just going to keep working it in and in and in and in. But what I'm trying to do is remove material off of one side because this side's actually very, very flat. Show you here. This side's very flat, it's very nice. This side needs removed. As you can see, we have a nice little platform. That's why I want to hit it so bad. But I'm just developing this platform as much as I possibly can, very gently. Like, I'm just rocking my wrist right now. I'm using kind of the, the pad on my finger as a fulcrum, and I'm just, just kind of, I'm not getting a big grip and trying to drive. I'm just trying to crush like this. Not hard. Just, I'm doing kind of the same thing the abrader does, but on a slightly larger level. Now, when it's all done coming off, we're going to abrade it. And you can see the platform that that's made. Okay, now we're going to flip it over and this side's going to go down like this. And then... We're going to start on the edge. We're not going to start right in the middle as much as I want to start in the middle. We're going to start on this edge. We're going to rock it back. We don't want to push too hard because we could still snap this point, but we're going to push pretty hard. Find that and rock it and drive that flake. Just like that. And then a, just a light abrade. We don't need to abrade the crap out of it. Just a little bit. Same thing. Now instead of continuing to work towards it, what we've actually done, we have isolated this platform a huge amount, and actually so much so that it's undercut. And what I mean by that is it's it's actually got a little bit of a dish. You can see the dish right here. You can see that right now, it comes right across, and then it dishes, and then it's flat. So if we actually try to run into it, we could hinge it right here. And that's one of the reasons we don't want to turn it over and just hit it with a billet because it's going to hit right here 
it's the energy is going to stop and it's going to snap that point right there. So that's why we don't do it. Now sometimes, like if you're making a paleo point, uh, making a Clovis, you're going to actually build a beautiful little nippled platform just like this and you're going to smack that off to drive the flute. But the problem is, um, here, like I said, we have this dish. Well, you wouldn't have this if you were doing uh, a paleo point that just that's kind of an anomaly that wouldn't exist if you were doing that but that's a different lesson for another day so what we need to do is be very patient we're not going to try to remove this entire flake by itself it's not like we're going to hit this and try to flute it and knock this big giant piece off what we're going to do is we're going to incrementally take a couple little flakes grind it off take a couple little flakes grind it off take a couple little flakes and we're going to eat this whole thing right away so we don't want to we're not trying to come in here and just be like cool i'm gonna latch onto this thing and grip it and rip it and, and yank it down could it work sure it might work but we also stand a good chance of screwing up all the work we've just done for the last oh you know 40 minutes or so so what i'm doing is i'm pushing that off and i'm working all the way across it so i want to show it to you right now the way it looks remember we had that nice little nipple I, there's a flake here, there was a flake here, there was a flake here. So we're just incrementally getting rid of it. Now when I come back to it, I'm going to grind it off and I'm going to come here again. Although I'm not quite to the end, but right where it kind of meets the the rest of it, right here. I'm going to pull it here and I'm going to pull it here and pull it here. And that is going to thin our base. Now notice I didn't sit here and just grind the crap out of it because it's going to be hard to grip this thing to knock it off. I hit it two or three times just like that and now it's got just enough that I can grab it and I can drive the fl these flakes and what I'm really trying to do at this point, I'm going to grind it off, is I want to rock it back and I want to get that big flake, put some real pressure and I want to drive a fairly significant flake off of it. So I'm going to do that all the way across it. And these significant flakes that I'm talking about aren't like they're three miles long. I mean, they're, they're quite literally probably three-eighths of an inch long. So that one's not even that big. And you can kind of see it's, that's, probably, that's probably a quarter of an inch. So that's not a, a very long one. But it's there, kind of that. Again, maybe a maybe a skosh more than a quarter of an inch. I'm gonna knock that off and come back and do it again. And I'm gonna remove as many of these as I can until until this side is actually relatively flat. Now you can see what's happened here. Follow that center line all the way up. Have you seen what's happened here? Our center line used to be on this side, right? Well, because we've, again, removed these materials, we've moved the center line to this side. You can see how it's almost completely flat. It goes completely all the way straight up. And then this side's the one that bevels. So what we want to do, we're going to take our flaker and just crush this a little bit more. Not much, just a little. And then we're going to abrade. And then one of the things, too, I want to kind of point out. This isn't always the case, but sometimes maybe it makes a difference, maybe it doesn't. I want to remove flakes off of this side. So I want to, just like I would if I was trying to build a platform, I want to actually abrade the direction that I wanted to, to build the platform. So opposite that, so now I flip it over, that I want to remove the flakes. And I actually do think that that makes a difference. So especially as you get closer to a finished product, when you're ready to abrade, like now, and again, I'm here I'm actually kind of making another little nipple. I want to abrade away from the direction that I want to remove the flake. So I was abrading this way. I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to remove the flakes down. OK, 
okay? It's probably in about an inch and an eighth wide. If I had to take a guess, it's, it's maybe a skosh wide for an arrow point. It's not too bad, it's pretty good. So now we're actually, instead of just working this down to a point size that I specifically want, this isn't a bad point to work with at this point. Let's go ahead, let's notch it, let's sharpen it, let's get the job done. So you can see really where we're at with this. So, we're going to take, remember our screwdriver looking thing? What I'm going to do, because it's so, uh, so beautifully perpendicular here, I'm going, a lot of people really love these like Cahokia side notch type, type points, so like this. So I'm going to do notches here, because doing corner notches is a little bit more difficult. It's not incredibly difficult, but it's a little bit more difficult. So what I'm going to do is some side notches. And we're going to take, obviously, we're not doing it flat ways like this. We're turning the flat end a screwdriver looking piece up on its end like this. Okay, so we're not trying to do this and nap down this way. We're going to turn it this way. Okay. And then I'm going to come down all oh, about a half an inch or so. And I'm going to put right in like I want to remove a nice flake. Just like that. Sometimes it crushes. Sometimes it gives a nice flake. Now flip the whole point over, push it in, and remove another one. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do this, is zoom right in so you can kind of see a little bit better what I'm doing. Let's see here, so you can see just a tiny little bit right there. And what you do is I kind of, I don't go straight in. I go a little bit this way, and a little bit this way, and a little bit this, and this is exaggerated. But when I'm in the notch, I'm going to remove a flake this way, and then I'm going to remove one this way, and then I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to remove one this way, and then I'm going to remove one this way, and then I'm going to flip it over. So I'm going like this until I get that notch uh, eat, eight out. Now, I'm not saying that you can't just get one flake removal and but that's the technique I typically use is there we go you heard it kind of let go now I'm gonna flip it over so that was the one that was going this way now I'm gonna go one that's kind of back to me okay and then I'm gonna flip the point I'm gonna do one that goes notching is something that takes a lot of practice I'm not gonna lie if you want, if you're afraid of destroying your point, my, because here we go, here's here's how we're kind of starting on that. It's a pretty decent little notch. It's not in there very far. In fact, we probably won't do them very far because you're not, a, just getting started, you're not experienced enough to get this notch all the way to center. Be happy with what you have at first. You're not going to be perfect from the word go. But what I want you to do, don't take a, a thick one, but I want you to reach down in your debitage pile and I want you to find a little flake like this. Okay, nothing spectacular. I'm gonna put this one here for good safekeeping. Grind it off, okay? Practice over and over and over. Even if it's the only thing you do for a whole night is before you ever notch your point, pick up debitage, pick up garbage, grind it off and practice notching your debitage, just like this. That's going to teach you how far you can actually go in. You see how it actually kind of like made an E notch? You see there's like a little a little nipple right in the middle of that? So we move one here and we move one here. And then we flip it over and we move one here and we remove one here. And it makes this little nipple in the middle. And that's what we call an E notch. And the basics of an E notched point or an E notch notch is that there is that little nipple. What people don't realize is that's so you can grab better. Now what happens is you get too far, this is gonna happen. Whoop, couldn't see it, it blew up because the camera didn't focus, but I split it in half. That's because the point, or the little flake we had, had no substance to support it. Now, what we're doing is the same exact thing on our point. So after you've practiced, even, I don't care if it's like I said, for a whole night, you're going to work on notching your point. I want you to do a very small e-notch. One this way, one this way, 
and then flip it over one this way and one this way so again I'm going to show this to you this is an advanced technique but I want to show it to you because it's very important and I want you to really focus in on this you can see I know it's very 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 hard to see there is a tiny nipple right in the middle it's because I removed flake off this side and then this side and I flipped it over and then I did on this side and this side and that is going to give you the best notching possible now if you do one side and the other side doesn't want to go don't force it if you brute force it you're gonna break it flip it over skip that side get that one to release and then try this side sometimes it crushes you hear that one crush that one kinda of crushed itself through that happens flip it over that one didn't want to go I got a teeny tiny little flake but not much so I'm gonna go back that one went just fine but you don't force it you try if it doesn't work do this one first then do this one see now that time it went flip it over that side went just fine and then that side now I want to show you this again this side is actually much this is a thinner notch but this one's deeper we have the potential to go deeper typically go typically what happens is if you have one that's wider you can kind of usually go a little bit deeper if you have one that's super narrow it's gonna stall out on you pretty quick so anyway those are the differences between the notches is one better than the other absolutely not absolutely not whatsoever so anyway I'm gonna clean these up I'll probably, what I'll probably do is what I usually like to do is if I have a wider notch I take the thinner notch and I just kinda eat it out and make it as large as the other one so it's very symmetrical like this and it doesn't take much you just kinda chew on the sides a little bit and then I'll reach up into it and just kinda yank another one or two out no big deal and then you end up with something that's a little bit more consistent just like that and it's not perfect but it's pretty darn close so anyway let's take a little break and I'll come back and we're gonna sharpen this thing up and then we are finished alright so we do have our point and it's notched and it's ready to go we're gonna sharpen the edge now I am not gonna spend a ton of time explaining I'm gonna show you once or twice or two or three times whatever on sharpening this because I have a whole video on sharpening in which I basically just take like a rough preform or a flake and I sharpen aside and I go through the whole sharpening process I could literally do another whole hour video just on sharpening a lot of people will stop right here and they'll be like cool I got an arrowhead right yeah cuz I mean you look at it and you're like hell yeah man I got an awesome arrowhead right now this thing is dull is all people be like ah, it's pretty sharp and I've heard people be like, well, that's sharper than it feels. I mean, when it's flying, when it's flying super, super duper fast, it's going to, it's going to slam into it and cuts. Listen, if you can take this thing and rub it and it doesn't cut you, it is not sharp. I promise you, I promise, I'm not giving you a line to sell you on sharp points. If you can't cut your skin with this, it is not going to cut a deer any better. I promise you. So what we're going to do is we're going to sharpen this point and this is not good enough. You have to sharpen this before you hunt it. Is it an arrowhead? Absolutely. Is it sharp? It is not sharp. It is not even remotely sharp. So what I'm going to do, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you start at the tip or you start back here, it doesn't matter. Uh, usually I start back here and I like to usually do two or three. Now is a good time also your, your little pressure flaker that you have is we're going to sharpen that and so you take a get your file if you don't have the file does not come in the kit but just go to the hardware store and just pick up a file of, of pretty much any kind whatever is going to remove material and try to put it a little bit a little bit more of a sharper edge on that tip and I could probably work it down just a little bit more but I think we're, we're pretty good where it's at now again it's kind of starting at the back of the arrowhead and we're gonna work up is we're gonna I don't want to braid really heavy you can if you, if you think it's really soft you can or it's it's really kind of knife edge I don't want to abrade the crap out of it 
but it doesn't hurt to just take like one or two swipes. If you braid it really heavy, it, it does get hard to remove some flakes at this point. Just like two hits. I'm going to start here and I'm going to take one there. And then I'm going to come up basically the same width as my flaker. I'm going to come up that far again. And then sometimes you have enough you can take a third one up here. Sometimes, not always. And then we're going to jump it. We're going to come down here. We're going to take one there. And you're going to do this all the way down. Almost one click. Sometimes, if the first click doesn't go or it crushes, grab onto it and do it again. And then, and again, so pretty much every single, you can see how it's, we're doing this, so every time I remove a flake here, I'm gonna skip basically a flaker's amount and go here, and then here, and here, then we'll skip it here, here. So if you do them one after another, all you're going to do is create a straight edge. We don't want a straight edge, we want a serrated edge because if you watch in that video, I explain how the serrated edges are just absolutely devastatingly sharp. So anyway, once you go all the way down on one side, if, when you get to the tip, don't manhandle it because you are going to snap that tip right off. You want to put it right on the edge and just very gently tick, just knock it right off. You're going to break tips off. As you learn to do this, you are going to break the tips off your arrowheads and it's not a big deal. Just rework it. The important thing is that you don't end up making an arrowhead that comes up to a round point. You want it to be very sharp on the end. Now, we removed all these little, well, that's the wrong side. We removed all these flakes going this way um, on the camera. It's coming from me to you. So we laid it down like this and we removed all these little flakes all the way this. Now we're going to turn it over and on the inside, like here's a good one here to show, on the inside, that's where we're going to remove a flake the other way. So here, I'm not going to go on the tippy tip of it because we're using that as a sharp point. We're going to go on the inside and remove another flake. All the way down the same process that we just did. We're going to try to give it just enough pressure. We're not trying to drive a big long flake. We're trying to drive a small flake, but we want it. We don't want it to just crush. I could come in here and just go that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is put it right on there and just go very simple. One little flake. And then we're going to just keep moving all the way down inside. Not on the tips. Remember, inside the same little serration that we already made. If the first one doesn't let go, go do it again. You know, just go ahead and keep hitting that and then very light when you get to the tip. In the tip, I'm not actually worried about being in the serrations, probably like the last, eh, probably last half an inch or so or towards the tip. You can see I'm not trying to make serrations because I want to make something that's really sharp that goes in. But you see the little serrations we've made? Now there's a difference between grinding in serrations, just where you're just like and them not being, like you should literally be able to take this and it should grab your skin. That's not even sharp enough yet, okay? But it's close, it's very sharp, but it's not sharp enough. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it back on here and we're gonna take a little click out of each one very gently. And this does take so much practice. You're never gonna be able to just be like, the first time I'm ever sharpening an arrowhead, I'm gonna, it's gonna be super duper sharp. It's like, you could spend as much time practicing to sharpening an arrowhead as much as you do making one. So that's why it's not a, it's not something you're gonna watch this video and be like, well now I'm a master at this. I can make an, it's, it's gonna take a lot of practice. So you can see this side, when a lot of people stop, this is not a sharp arrowhead on this side. But this side, quite honestly, is violent. Like when I shoot this through a deer, it will grab lung tissue cut it and yank it out the other side like it's sharp and if you have ever seen 
the videos I do, I've actually got quite a callus on here because I do this all the time. I test my points on the back of my thumb because I can't feel them here. A lot of times people go like this. I mean, with the calluses and stuff that's on my fingers, I can't, I can't feel this at all because my fingertips are almost dead because I do this stuff for a living. So I test on the back of my hand where it's sensitive and you can feel because it hurts. It'll catch you and cut you. And I'm just gently touching it and just doing this, sometimes I end up, you can actually see it right there. I don't know if you can or not. You can see right there, I'm actually starting to have a little drop of blood that's appearing. So I'm just doing this and it's cutting it. Now we're just gonna sharpen the tip. Now when I come down to doing the tip, the very tip, a lot of times again, people still, you don't want it rounded at all. Uh, you don't want it broken off. You want this thing to come down to a needle tip. So when you essentially push it like into you, you don't, like right now it's not bad. I can actually push it into me. And sure, if I shot a deer with this, it might be okay, but the problem is you're taking energy away from the shot every time that you try to shoot an animal with a point that's not super sharp. You can tell that that's sharp, but you can also see that there's like a micro little flat spot. So I can, I can do this. If I did this when it was really sharp, man, I'd jab that thing right into me. So what I want you to do, was lay it down and you take the side of your flaker and very gently almost massage the side until you get these teeny tiny tiny like I don't even I can't even express teeny tiny tiny flakes you're talking about removing dust essentially off the side and I'm not going far not going far, let the camera focus here. Come on, camera. Work with me. There we go. I'm not going all the way up. I'm talking from here to here. And I'm just almost very gently, you can hear it almost just ever so slightly. Whoop, one little teeny tick right at the tip. It's almost scary because you're afraid of breaking it. Then, once it's super duper, like that's not even quite good enough, but what I'll do is I'll use the abrader, and if you're gentle, you can actually abrade the little tip right on. And if it's not on there, you just go back and do it some more. It's not sharp, see, like, like this is pretty sharp, but if I can jam my finger on it, it doesn't get me, it's not sharp enough. That's the difference between doing it really good and, and doing it, eh, it's okay, kind of good. So let's camera focus one more time. We are almost done. And you can see now how devastatingly sharp that tip is, right? I mean, that is as sharp as you will ever get it. That thing is crazy. Like when I touch it with my finger, you can feel it grabbing my fingerprints. That's how sharp that is. You can see, literally see it grabbing. I'm barely touching it and it's grabbing and pulling my finger. Very, very sharp. So now we got the sides that are very sharp that will literally cut me. That's why you have to have all these big, beautiful calluses that your wife will like. So you have this scary sharp serrations and this needle sharp tip you can see how absolutely sharp that is so anyway thank you for hanging with me with this ridiculously long amount of time because i wanted to show well, one more thing one more thing real quick ouch cut myself when you get down to the the base side where you where you are going to mount it just hit it with your abrader just the back because there's no sense in having this super sharp where it could potentially, it's not super important, but if you doll, you don't want to doll up here, just right here, because this is where you're going to mount it to the arrow shaft. It is just like this. But you can see how absolutely, it's perfectly thin, beautifully shaped. It's actually a little bit bigger than what I normally like. Very, very sharp, very, very sharp little needle point. This is a killing point. I hope that you enjoyed the very, very long instruction on making this point and I hope I genuinely hope that this helps you in your flint napping remember all this stuff while you do not absolutely do not need to buy it from huntprimitive.com I do appreciate your support 
Um, but anywhere you get good rock, good napping tools, the important thing is you're out here doing it. So we'll catch you on the next adventure.